I want to welcome you all to the Quantic and Talk Historical Society's summer season. My name is Bill Steinman. I'm the archivist, the newly minted archivist of the Quantic Historical Society. We've got a great summer planned with sessions. After this one, on Wednesday, July 26th at 7 p.m., we're having a historic Kwani virtual home tour. Steve Young from the Kwani Historical Society will give us a peek inside the nun's house on West Beach. And our own Leah Bradshaw will give us a tour of some of Kwani's tiny cottages. On Wednesday, August 9th, again at 7 p.m., Ken Andrew, also from the Kwani Historical Society, will be talking about the development of the Kwanik and Tog Neck, which I'm calling Associations, Fire Districts, and Water Companies, oh my. <laughs> Sorry, Ken. We end the season on August 23rd at 6.30. We'll have a brief membership meeting. And after that, we'll have our final session, which is on Kwani Marsh restoration. And we have a special guest, Wenley Ferguson from Save the Bay, will be coming and talking to us about the work to save Kwani's ponds. If you are not a member and interested in joining, we have membership forms in the back. You do not have to live in Kwanik and Tog to be a member. Restrooms are in the basement if you need them. And there will be no test at the end, I've been told to emphasize. But I will save time for questions. And with that, let's get started. Hopefully that music's not too loud. I want to take you all back in time to Saturday, May 5th, 1945. And I want to tell you a dramatic true story from the Second World War that happened just a few miles from where we're sitting and was witnessed from Quantic and Tog shores. May 5th dawned over South County, relatively clear and seasonably cool, but by mid-morning, a thick fog bank had rolled in. The SS Black Point, a coal ship headed for Boston, was approaching the Block Island Sound from the west. To be on the safe side, her captain, Charles Pryor, ordered the crew to drop anchor and wait for the fog to burn off. The Black Point was sailing without a military escort, but Captain Pryor wasn't worried. And why should he be? The war in Europe was all but over. Adolf Hitler was dead. German troops were surrendering to the Allies en masse. The Battle of Berlin was over, and the Red Army was firmly in control of the German capital. So when the fog started to burn off late in the afternoon, Captain Pryor ordered his crew to weigh anchor, and the Black Point resumed its voyage to Boston. Captain Pryor was confident that the ship was safe, and so he steamed straight on rather than in a defensive zigzag pattern. And yet suddenly, there was an explosion, visible from the beach right here in Kwani. At 5.40 PM, the Black Point was struck by a torpedo, fired by a German submarine, or U-boat, and it hit her on her starboard side. She sank within 25 minutes and took 12 souls with her to the bottom. Oddly enough, 24 hours earlier, the Third Reich had instructed all U-boats to cease hostile action against Allied shipping. And in less than 72 hours, the war in Europe would officially end. This is the story of that fateful day and the events that led up to it, the final battle of the Atlantic. Now, to understand the whole story, I've got to take you back in time a little bit. First, we're going to go back to Germany in the summer of 1943. Then we're going to go to the North Atlantic in the summer of 1944. We're going to visit the coast of Maine in April of 1945. And finally, we return to our own shores here in Rhode Island in May of 1945. So let's start 
in Germany. Hopefully the music won't be too loud. I can adjust that if it is. In June of 1943 in Bremen, our antagonist, a German submarine or U-boat that sunk the Black Point was commissioned. It entered service. And like all U-boats during the war, it carried a number. And its number was 853. I know a little Wagner, right? How can you resist? <laughs> 853 was a Type 9C 40 U-boat and was designed for deep water operation in the Atlantic. She was 252 feet long, had a pretty narrow beam at 22 feet, and she weighed 740 tons. She could do 19 knots top speed on the surface, and she could do seven to eight knots submerged. She had six torpedo tubes and carried 22 torpedoes. 853 had two forms of propulsion. First, she had twin diesel, motor, diesel engines that required fresh air to run. And operating on her diesel engines, 853 had a range of 11,400 nautical miles without refueling. 853 also had electric motors powered by a bank of lead acid batteries mounted inside the hull. And those electric motors propelled her when she was submerged. 853 could cruise for about 63 nautical miles submerged before she had to resurface and charge those batteries using her diesel engines. She had a crew of 55, most of them in their late teens and early 20s. Now, something to bear in mind as we tell this story, U-boats were designed to operate on the surface. They're surface ships with the capability of operating submerged for limited periods of time, particularly early in the war. In the early period of the war, a typical U-boat would spend only 2 to 3% of its operational patrol underwater. The rest of the time, it would be on the surface. That'll change, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Now we arrive in the North Atlantic in May and June 1944. U-853 is on her first war patrol. She's assigned to monitoring weather in the North Atlantic. The German military was obsessed with knowing the weather. They felt that it had significant impact on operations on the continent, and she parked a lot of U-boats in the Central Atlantic who gave regular weather updates to the German high command. And that was 853's first mission. She's under the command of Captain Lieutenant Helmut Sommer, who's the old man of the boat, at 29 years old. Her second in command is a fella named Oberlieutenant Zert C, which I've mispronounced, Helmut Fromsdorf. He's 23 years old, second in command of the boat. On her first patrol, on May 25, 1944, 853 spots the RMS Queen Mary, the luxury liner turned troop transport. She's known as the Grey Ghost of the Atlantic because she's been painted gray. She was a highly sought after target for U-boats. And 853 starts to pursue. There's only one problem. The Queen Mary is fast. She can cruise at 28.5 knots, and she quickly outruns 853. But during the pursuit, 853 is spotted on the surface by British swordfish aircraft. I'm just going to turn that down for a minute. Bear with me. Sorry, guys. There we go. That's better. Thank you for your patience. So she's spotted on the surface by two British anti-submarine aircraft known as swordfish. And Captain Sommer orders his crew to engage the aircraft with the U-boats and aircraft guns. And believe it or not, that was standard operating procedure at that time in the German U-boat fleet. The idea was that U-boats were particularly vulnerable when diving, 
and you could identify where the boat was and its heading, because it makes a lot of froth and, and bubbles in the water. Now, they actually hit all three aircraft. By the way, that uh, graphic is from Captain Sommer's uh, ship's log that he kept during uh, U-853's first patrol describing the path of the swordfish bombers. So now the first hunt for 853 begins in earnest. The USS Croatan, a Navy escort carrier, and six destroyers start hunting for the U-boat. On June 17, the Croatan picks up a radio transmission from 853. It was transmitting weather reports back to Germany. And Navy ships at that time in the United States and in Great Britain had a technology known as Huff Duff. A detailed description of how that works is beyond tonight's presentation. But suffice it to say, Huff Duff could locate the source of a radio transmission. So the Croatan moves in on the 853. And Grumman F4 Wildcats from the Croatan find 853 on the surface. They dive at the sub from above the clouds, and they catch the crew of 853 unawares. Now again, Captain Somers resorts back to his old trick. He tells his crew to man the anti-aircraft guns, but this time they're not as lucky. The Wildcats make four runs on the 853. The sub's crew hits one of them, and it peels off, but the other plane manages to bomb 853, killing two of its crew, severely wounding four more, and Captain Somers himself suffers 28 bullet and shrapnel wounds and is knocked unconscious. He quickly regains consciousness and tells the boat to dive, and the boat safely makes it to deep water. The wounded Somers puts Fromsdorf, the young second in command, in charge of the boat. But he puts him in charge of the boat, quote, under my guidance, which is not a ringing endorsement. And although Somers reports later at the end of this patrol that the crew's performance was, quote, perfect, it's Somers and not his second in command, Fromsdorf, who continues to maintain the boat's log until it gets back to port. The boat, again nominally under Fromsdorf's control, goes back to a U-boat base in Lorient, France for repairs and arrives there on July 4th, 1944. They, at that point, because 853 had taken so many risks but had survived all of them, the crew gives the boat a name, the Tightrope Walker. They also decide she needs a logo so they paint a heraldic shield on her conning tower, a red horse on a yellow shield. After repairs, 853 goes from the U-boat base in Lorient, France, to temporarily dock in Germany, and then from Germany she heads to a U-boat base um, in Stavangar, Norway. And now, finally, Helmut Fromsdorf gets his moment. He's put in charge of the 853 for her next patrol. And on February 23, 1945, 853 leaves dock with instructions to disrupt Allied shipping along the U.S. East Coast. It takes her two months to cross the Atlantic, most of that underwater. And we'll talk about why that's possible later. During her transatlantic voyage, she makes virtually no contact with German high command. And that makes her virtually impossible for U-boat trackers in the British Navy and the US Navy to know where she is. And by the way, during the voyage, Fromsdorf celebrates his 24th birthday. <laughs> Now we come to the Gulf of Maine, just off Cape Elizabeth. It's April 23, 1945. 
the USS Eagle PE-56, shown here. It's a Navy ship that was built to hunt submarines in the First World War. And she's now been relegated to towing targets for Navy pilots to practice on. And between training runs, the Eagle 56 comes to a full stop at 12.14 PM. And suddenly, while she's at a full stop, she explodes amidships, splits in two, and sinks in minutes. And 49 of her crew are lost. Five survivors from the Eagle in the Gulf of Maine separately report seeing a U-boat surface nearby. And they indicate that it has red and yellow markings. The Eagle has become 853's first and penultimate victim. Now, the Eagle's sinking sets off an 11-day search spanning an area from the Gulf of Maine to the south coast of Rhode Island. Immediately after the Eagle's sinking, the US Navy and Coast Guard begin to comb the Gulf of Maine with a combined force consisting of five destroyers, three destroyer escorts, and three frigates. In the air, they're supported by US Navy PBY-5 Catalina flying boats and Lockheed PV-1 Ventura aircraft, all flying out of Brunswick Naval Air Station. This combined force picks up sonar signals that they believe is a submarine in the Gulf of Maine. But because of the rough seabed, the number of old shipwrecks in the area, they're unable to definitively identify the U-boat. But the next day, April 24, there's a breakthrough. One of the frigates, the USS Muskegon, spots smoke on the surface from no known source near Roaring Bull Ledge in the Gulf of Maine. And she immediately steams to the location. But she finds nothing. The hunt continues the next day on April 25th. Again, the Muskegon. Her hydrophones, an underwater listening device, picks up the sounds of a submarine's engine near the mouth of the Penobscot Bay followed by definitive sonar contact. And it seems that 853 has parked herself on the bottom, hoping to avoid detection. Well, it doesn't work. The Muskegon immediately engages, launching Mark 9 barrel depth charges from special launchers on the sides of the ship known as K-guns. We'll talk a little bit about those in a minute. And a full complement of mortar-like Hedgehog depth charge is shown there on the left. There's impact, but it's unclear whether it's on the German sub or not. April 26, the hunt for the mysterious sub continues. A PBY-5 Catalina at a Quonset nearby picks up a U-boat on the surface using its radar. The Catalina flies to the location and drops a buoy equipped with sonar. And again, it picks up the U-boat now surfaced. The Catalina drops two depth charges and spots oil slicks and debris floating on the surface. But did it hit the U-boat or is it a ploy? It was a common trick for U-boat captains to put debris uh, and, and oil and the like in the submarine's tubes and ejected out with the hopes that sub hunters would think that they'd sunk it and move on. For the next couple of days, there's no sign of the 853. And at this point, it's now dubbed the Moby Dick by Navy and Coast Guard personnel up and down the eastern seaboard for, of course, Melville's elusive white whale. <coughs> Then on April 29, a Grumman F4F Wildcat flying out of Charlestown Auxiliary Naval Station this time. Everybody's so excited. We've mentioned Charlestown. <laughs> the Wildcat briefly spots a U-boat on the surface 10 miles off Wellfleet on Cape Cod. 853 is clearly moving south, and she's approaching Rhode Island. And like Moby Dick, she continues to evade her pursuers. Mm 
the sub disappears for another six days. And now we come to May 1945. In Europe, the end of the war is just days away. As I mentioned before, Hitler's dead, and the father of the German U-boat service, Admiral Karl Dernitz, is the new leader of Nazi Germany. And he is in the midst of surrender negotiations with the Allies in the West. And on the afternoon of May 4 US time, he broadcasts a message from the massive Goliath radio array in Germany. And his message is this, U-boats, attention all U-boats, cease fire at once, stop all hostile action against Allied shipping, signed Dernitz. Now the Goliath amazingly has a worldwide range. Uh, and they continue to broadcast the stand down order for the next day. But here we are, back to where we began, May 5th, 1945. This time in the morning, 1015. In that morning, a Grumman TBF Avenger out of Quonset Point, sorry, not Charlestown, was flying over the Long Island Sound and it was helping to train US submarine crews to spot aircraft. By 1015, the exercise is over, and as I mentioned earlier, although May 5th dawned clear, by mid-morning a fog bank had started to move in. So the Avenger heads back to Rhode Island. And on its way, its pilot and its radio man both spot the distinctive conning tower of a German U-boat, just off Montauk, heading east. The Avenger's unarmed, it's on a training mission, and it's under orders to maintain radio silence. After all, there's still a war on. So they head back to Quonset to report the sighting. The pilot and the radio man meet with Quonset Station's intelligence officer and give him a briefing which lasts about three hours. Unfortunately, the intel officer is skeptical about the sighting. And at the end of the briefing at about 4 p.m., the skeptical intel officer says that he'll notify the Navy base in Newport about the sighting. It's unknown if he ever forwarded along the message. And now, here we are, back at 5.40 p.m. The SS Black Point, the coal ship headed for Boston, is steaming past Point Judith. Remember earlier in the day during the fog, Captain Pryor ordered the crew to drop anchor rather than push on with low visibility. Well, the fog has finally burned off. The Black Point weighs anchor and has resumed her journey to Boston. Let's talk a little bit about the Black Point. She was launched as the USS Fairmont as a US Navy cargo ship and saw service in World War I. She's decommissioned in 1919 and ultimately renamed the Black Point. She's not terribly big, she's 369 feet long. She's got a complement of 41 officers and crew in the Merchant Marine and five Navy guards aside, assigned to man her single rear-mounted deck gun. The Black Point was loaded with about 8,000 tons of coal in Virginia and was heading for Boston. And as I mentioned before, she had no escort, and she was steaming straight on rather than in a defensive zigzagging pattern. A zigzagging pattern was designed to make a ship harder for U-boats to target and sink. And at 5.40 PM, about three miles off Point Judith, she struck on the starboard side by a torpedo fired by the U-boat 853. The explosion is dramatic. It tears off. 40 feet of the Black Point's stern. Her captain, Charles Pryor, immediately gives the order to abandon ship, and by 6.05 p.m., she's gone underwater with 12 of her crew. The Moby Dick, the tightrope walker, has claimed another victim. This one, however, would be its last. Now, several ships in the Block Island Sound see the sinking of the Black Point. One of them, 
is a Yugoslav freighter named the Carmen. The Carmen steams to the stricken Black Point and also sends out an SOS. It picks up Captain Pryor and 16 of his men in life rafts. The SOS is also picked up by rescue boats at a Quonset point who pull another 15 men alive out of the water. Now, oddly enough, just like the crew of the Eagle a few days before in Maine, the crew of the Carmen spot a U-boat surface near where the Black Point has been torpedoed. This time, members of the crew of 853 come out of the U-boat onto its deck. And then moments later, they go back inside the sub and it dives. To this day, we have absolutely no idea what they were doing, but I've got some theories. The Carmen's SOS reaches several Navy and Coast Guard vessels operating about 30 miles to the south. They've just come off convoy duty and are generally heading towards Boston for much needed repairs. They consist of the USS Moberly, which is a Coast Guard manned uh, Tacoma class patrol frigate, the USS Atherton, a destroyer escort, and the USS Amic, also a destroyer escort. The three ships are heavily armed for anti-submarine warfare. Each of them has twin depth charge racks mounted on her stern, each of their sterns. And the depth charge racks carry 12 to 13 depth charges each. Each of them also has eight side-mounted K-guns, unlike a depth charge rack shown there on the right, which essentially drop depth charges by gravity rolling down the rack. A K-gun fires a depth charge to the side of the ship using compressed air. And each of these ships has eight of them. And then finally, each ship has bow-mounted hedgehog depth charge launchers which can launch mortar-like depth charges in a circular pattern in front of the ship. Now, the barrel depth charges are hydrostatic. That means they, they explode at a certain depth, and the crew in, you know, designates, arms them to explode at a certain depth. Hedgehogs explode on contact. Now, around 7.20 PM, the three ships that I mentioned before, the Moberly, the uh, Atherton, and the Amic, reach the site of the Black Point sinking. And they establish a scouting line and begin sonar searches from Point Judith to a point 10 miles south and then head north again. Now, the Atherton sonar crew is considered the best of the three ships. So she takes the middle position. And the Amic is on the west, just in case 853 tries to ex escape that way and the Moberly is on the right. The idea is that the U-boat is heading for the east ground near Block Island, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. The idea was that perhaps the 853 was gonna hide on the bottom next to the sharply rising shoal, where depths go from below 100 feet to up to 50 feet. And during their search, Finally, at 1014, sonar contact. And again, I'm going to turn off the music, sorry. We have sonar contact. The Atherton's crack sonar team at 1014 PM picks up the 853, due south of where the sub had sank the Black Point. The Atherton's hydrophones, remember underwater listening gear, also pick up the sound of the sub's propellers as the sub tries to make its escape. And at 10.30 PM, the Ather Atherton drops barrel depth charges and fires two rounds of hedgehogs at U-853's suspected position. 
Although all of those attacks resulted in explosions, it's unclear whether they'd hit the submarine, whether they hit an old shipwreck, or exploded on the bottom, particularly those hedgehogs. But for the next hour, the Atherton and Moberly search for 853. The Amic, which I mentioned before, leaves to protect uh, merchant vessels in the vicinity in case they fall victim to 853. Near 1145 PM, the Atherton picks up a sonar contact again, a few thousand yards away from the first attack. The Atherton launches another round of hedgehogs, and this time she spots oil, debris, and air bubbles on the surface. This is the beginning of the end for U-boat 853. And shortly after midnight, the Atherton makes one more depth charge run, and she sees more oil, bubbles, and debris rise to the surface. And if you read the after action report written by the Atherton's commander, he describes the air bubbles and the oil roiling to the surface like a fountain. By dawn on May 6, the USS Ericsson, a Gleaves cast destroyer, arrives on the scene. Its commander is the senior officer in the area, and he takes over direction of the battle. And early on the 6th, the Atherton continues her depth charge attacks. But because the water is so shallow, the Atherton sustains damage to her navigation equipment from her own depth charges. <laughs> so she moves off to conduct repairs. And the Moberly, the US Coast Guard crewed vessel, takes over the attack, launching numerous depth charge runs over 853. And its depth charge runs and hedgehogs result in additional underwater explosions with more debris rising to the surface. This is taken from the Moberly. You can see the Atherton in the background. At this point, everybody wants a piece of the action. For most of the early morning hours, the Atherton, the US Coast Guard's Moberly, and the Ericsson take turns launching depth charges and hedgehogs on 853's position. This is a depth charge run by the Ericsson. And then around 6 AM, two K-type blimps arrive from Lakehurst, New Jersey. K-type blimps, basically Goodyear blimps drafted into military service. They were used throughout the war for spotting submarines. And the two airships, K-16 and blimp K-58, search for debris, and photograph the battle. Now, blimp K-16 drops a buoy equipped with sonar, and it records intermittent rhythmic metallic hammering. Is 853's crew trying to surrender? Are they trying to escape? We don't know. In response, both airships drop their own depth charges. <laughs> Then around 11 AM on May 6th, the USS Semmes arrives at the scene. Now, she is an aging destroyer, but she's equipped with experimental submarine locating gear. And she asks permission from the commander of the Ericsson, who's commanding the battle, to make a run at locating the 853, which she immediately does. And you guessed it. She launches a round of her own depth charges. <laughs> At this point, the U-853 is declared sunk officially at 1224 PM. During the course of the battle, over 200 depth charges are dropped on the submarine. And that's over 25,000 pounds of TNT, which is roughly 12.5 tons. This is the bare minimum. To be honest, I haven't been able to figure out if this is the total amount of TNT dropped on the 853, or if this was just what was dropped by the Atherton. These numbers come from the Atherton commander's after action report. He doesn't specifically say that he's referring to his own vessel's depth charges, but he may very well be. This figure also does not include 
the SEMS depth charges or the BLIMPS depth, char depth charges. In the end, this is the end of the last battle of the Atlantic. Here are some photos of debris collected on the surface from 853. It includes life rafts, a flagstaff, a table, flotation gear, a tabletop, I mentioned that before, a mattress, and perhaps most significantly, an officer's cap, which is later determined to belong to the boat's young captain, Helmut Fromsdorf. At 3.20 p.m., the USS Penguin arrives at the scene. The Penguin is a submarine rescue ship, and her divers are tasked with the following. Confirming 853 is sunk. Entering the boat and hopefully finding its logbook. And seeing if there are any survivors. Divers reach the boat, and they confirm that her sides have been split. They also reach the boat's conning tower, and they discover several bodies, some of which are wearing escape gear. In the end, the, Atherton's, the Atherton and her crew are credited with sinking 853. Her senior officer, Lieutenant Commander Lewis Eislin, is awarded the Legion of Merit, which is given, quote, for exceptionally meritorious conduct in the performance of outstanding services and achievement. The Coast Guard ship, the Moberly, is credited with assisting. And her senior officer, Lieutenant Commander Leslie Tollickson, is awarded the Bronze Star with Combat V for, quote, acts of valor or meritorious service in combat. And here's the crew of the Moberly painting a victory mark on the ship's superstructure depicting a U-boat. Couple of interesting side notes. One German soldier survives the battle, but he's not from the crew of 853. Young Private Franz Cronus was a POW, and he had acute appendicitis. And earlier in April, he is transported to the USS Atherton because the Atherton has a Navy surgeon on board. And the surgeon, Maurice Witzke, performs an emergency appendectomy on Cronus on April 20. Cronus is on board the Atherton recovering for the entirety of the battle. You can't make this stuff up. And then one final chapter. Although the battle was 78 years ago, it's still a part of living history. You may have read about this in the Projo. Last October, a trawler at a point, Judith, it's dragging for fluke off of Block Island, but it brings up something very different. It brings up a Mark VI depth charge that the Navy determines was one of the unexploded depth charges dropped on 853. It contains 300 pounds of TNT, certainly enough to ruin the trawler's day. The Navy takes it. They detonate it at sea. And by the way, as I'm sure many boaters and fishermen know, if you look at the nautical chart for Block Island Sound, it contains a warning about unexploded depth charges. And those are from the attack on 853, and she lies there to this day. In fact, I was just approached by a couple of folks just before the presentation who have uh, dived to 853. Um, and maybe they'll raise their hands, and you can chat with them afterwards if they're willing. Now, all of this is a very dramatic tale, right at the end of the Second World War. But it raises so many questions. First, and the question is, why did Helmut Fromsdorf, in charge of this U-boat so close to the end of the war, put the life of his crew in jeopardy? When he left Norway on February 23rd, the war was all but over. In the West, the, uh, the, the US Army had broken the last resistance in the Siegfried Line and entered Germany. In the East, the Red Army had crossed the Oder, and they were 40 miles from Berlin. So why put the crew of 853 at risk? 
Well, there are a number of theories. I'll tell you my favorite at the end. First, maybe 853 didn't receive the order from Admiral Dernitz, right, head of the submarine fleet, now head of the Third Reich, ordering U-boats to stop hostile action. Now, as I mentioned before, U-boats were designed as surface vessels, right? During the beginning of the war, a U-boat might only spend 2 to 3% of its entire tour submerged. Now in 1944 that changed. The German Navy started adding snorkels to U-boats allowing them to operate underwater for extended periods of time. And 853 was one of the boats retrofitted with a snorkel. Now before snorkels, when a boat was submerged, it had to run on our batteries and it had a limited range. After snorkels were fitted, a boat could operate underwater running its diesels because the diesels would pull fresh air through the snorkel. And theoretically, a U-boat with a snorkel could operate underwater indefinitely. Now, as I mentioned before, Admiral Dernitz's stand-down order to the U-boats was broadcast from the Goliath radio array in Germany. And it could reach worldwide. But there was only one problem. A submerged U-boat, even if it were operating only a few meters below the surface, couldn't receive a clear signal from the Goliath. So it could be that 853 simply missed the order. There was another problem. US government studies of U-boats after the Second World War discovered a whole lot of things. One of the things that they discovered is that a U-boat during extended operations underwater developed a dampness problem, and it could wreak havoc with the ship's electrical systems. And the US government determined that radio gear was particularly affected. And as I mentioned before, 853 probably spent most of her transatlantic journey submerged. So it's possible, dare I say it, that her radio was on the fritz. I, was getting a laugh. I can't take credit for that. Thanks, honey. Theory two. Perhaps Helmut Fromsdorf got the order, and he didn't believe it. Now, there were a handful of other U-boats operating off the East Coast in May of 1945. And one of those, a boat numbered U-530, received Dernitz's order. But during post-war interrogation, its captain, Otto Vermuth, who just looks so smarmy, by the way, said that he thought the transmission was a trick. So despite receiving the order, Vermuth and 530 attacked Allied ships off the US coast, launching torpedoes on the 4th, and the 5th, and the 6th. Now, they missed all their targets, thank goodness, but perhaps Fromsdorf had the same idea, that it was an enemy ruse. Theory three, this one's my favorite. Perhaps Fromsdorf had Halsschmerzen, or a sore throat. What does that mean? Well, the Third Reich's highest military award was the Knight's Cross and it was worn around your neck, as you can see with this U-boat commander wearing his Knight's Cross. Someone who wanted a Knight's Cross was said to have a sore throat, and only the metal could fix it. Now, 853's first captain, Helmut Sommer, who was wounded in 1944, he never won the Knight's Cross, but he won the Iron Cross second class, he won the Iron Cross first class, he won a gold cross, so he was highly decorated. <coughs> there is some evidence that Fromsdorf wanted his own sore throat cure. After the war, Clara Marie Somers, who was the wife of 853's first captain, wrote a reporter who was doing a story on the 853. And she recounted that Fromsdorf was ambitious and that her husband asked Fromsdorf not to risk the crew 
of 853 because the end of the war was so near. Two other members, at least two other members, we know of two, two other 853 crew members expressed similar concerns. One crew member wrote to his parents from Norway before 853 sailed that he had concerns and didn't have faith in Fromsdorf. Another guy, the luckiest guy on the planet, he missed 853's final voyage because he was ill. And after the war, he expressed the opinion and recounted that several of 853's crew members thought Fromsdorf just wanted to get a medal. Ultimately, it could just be that Fromsdorf was resigned to his fate. Now, for the U-boat service, we've mentioned Carl Dernitz a couple of times. But for the U-boat service, he wasn't some distant, far-off figure. He was the father of the U-boat service. He knew most of the captains personally. And he was often present when U-boats left dock and returned. They referred to him as their father. And so close to the end of the war, he made a lot of statements about continuing to fight. On March 20, he sent a dispatch to all U-boat crews telling them that they had to fight to the end. And then, on May 2nd, in his address to Germany upon becoming the leader of the Third Reich, he said that anyone who shirks his duty is a coward and a traitor, and brings death and slavery to German women and children. Boy, that's a lot. <laughs> now by then, at that point in the war, 28,000 German submariners had been killed. Almost 72% of the entire U-boat service had been killed in action. So maybe Fromsdorf thought he was just doing what was expected of him, and he was expected to fight to the bitter end. Ultimately, we can't ever know. <laughs> Honestly, all we can do is remember the men that lost their lives in those final days in the Battle of the Atlantic. The 54 men of the Eagle 56, the 12 men of the USS Black Point, and honestly, even the 55 men of U-853. Questions? <laughs>